please stay tuned to the end of this program or see the show notes for important information regarding today's speakers and the content of this podcast. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Allergy Talk, a roundup of the latest in the field of allergy and immunology by the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. For today's episode, we'll be reviewing three more articles from the July-August 2022 issue of Allergy Watch, a bi-monthly publication which provides research summaries to college members from the major journals of allergy and immunology. And you can also earn CME credit by listening to this podcast. For information about CME credit or to read archived issues of Allergy Watch, head over to college.acaai.org slash publication slash Allergy Watch. And also make sure you check out the ACAI community on Doc Matter where we can continue the discussion about these articles. Well, hi, my name is Jerry Lee. I'm an associate professor at Emory University and an assistant editor in Algae Watch. And once again, I'm joined by the editor-in-chief of Algae Watch, Dr. Stan Feynman. Hello again. It's great to be here. As Jerry said, I'm the editor-in-chief of Allergy Watch, and I'm in practice here in Atlanta at Atlanta Allergy and Asthma, and I'm on the clinical faculty at Emory. And for the third chair, we are once again joined by another Algae Watch assistant editor, Dr. Vivian hernandez Chahio. Hi, Jerry. It's great to be back. I am the Fellowship Training Program Director and Division Director of Allergy Immunology at Nicholas Children's Hospital and Clinical Professor at the Herbert Wertheim School of Medicine. Okay. Well, again, we got another three really interesting articles for this episode. So Stan, we'll start with you. And this is very interesting. You're saying we're testing for venom algae wrong? Well, the article says that. This is an article that was published in the Journal of Allergy, Clinical Immunology and Practice in March of 22. It's entitled Combining Discordant Serum IgE and Skin Testing Improves Diagnostic and Therapeutic Accuracy for Hymenoptera Venom Hypersensitivity Immunotherapy. And this is a study out of Walter Reed, in fact, is where the researchers are. And what they did is that basically, as everyone knows, Typically, in the, the practice parameters, the ones that were published, I think it was in 17, is the most recent ones, suggested doing intradermal skin testing as a standard approach for the diagnosis of hominoptera venom hypersensitivity. Then you do a serum IgE immunocap if you see a negative skin test and you suspect maybe the patient is still sensitized. So this study evaluated the concordance between these two tests, intradermal skin tests and immunocap. In patients who had suspected hymenoptera hypersensitivity, and they assessed the implications for venom immunotherapy. So this is a pretty practical study because they're looking at how these tests impact our treatment. It's a prospective study. They enrolled 70 patients. All of them had a history of a probable systemic reaction to hymenoptera venom. They also had a control group, which were 51 patients who did not have systemic reactions. And they all had intradermal skin testing, according to the protocol, and also immunocap testing. And they tested for the big five insects that we test for, including honeybee, wasp, yellow jacket, yellow hornet, and white faced hornet. They tested for all those venoms. And the results showed that there was a significant discordance between the positive results in the two tests. Patient cases had discordance in the wasp, yellow jacket, and white-faced hornet venom, and in a pooled analysis of all individual results, all discordance, there was 27.5%. You know, so in patients who had systemic reactions versus 8.2% in controls, so in both groups, about 80% of the discordances were immunocap positive and intradermal skin test negative. So that means in nearly half the patients, the venom immunotherapy prescription would have been different if the initial testing had included both the intradermal testing and the immunocap compared to the intradermal testing alone. So based on these discordant results, the researchers proposed that the immunocap should be done first for a diagnosis of suspected hymenoptera venom hypersensitivity. Then you do the intradermal for those patients who have a negative immunocap that you still suspect have a problem. And they suggest that this approach would reduce the likelihood of missed sensitizations as well as fewer intradermal tests and fewer venom immunotherapy prescription changes. 
So I thought this was really interesting. And what John Oppenheimer, who made comments on this for Allergy Watch, stated in his comments was that the authors suggest that the order of our testing be switched. So the immunocap be performed first and intradermal performed on all the negative tests. So he said that obviously that's something that we should consider. And quite frankly, I think that the practice parameter committee needs to look at these types of data and do that. Anyway, let me open it up for comments and then let's talk about what you're doing in your practice. Well, I'm going to make a huge confession. And so, so Stan, you can tell me if I'm off base here, but we actually don't see a lot of venom enough to keep the skin test extract around because it goes bad pretty quickly. So we actually do a lot of serum testing. And then when the testing is normal and we're still worried, we refer to your office for the skin test, Stan, you help us out. So I don't know if you, if we're abusing your clinic that way, but obviously your office is awesome. But that's what we're doing. I don't know how we feel about that. Stand. You know, it's interesting. I'm fine with it, obviously, because we do keep the venoms. But you are correct, Jerry. Venoms are very expensive and they're getting mm -hmm. more expensive. We just found out there's about a 20% plus higher fees for some of our extracts for next year, beginning next year. And so a lot of people do exactly what you do. They do the testing with Immunicap. And some of them don't do skin testing at all. And interestingly, I've started doing the immunocap first on some of my patients and found that in a lot of cases, I don't even need to do the intradermal testing because you clearly get these huge positive reactions. I had one who had a yellow jacket immunocap result was over 25 just yesterday. And so I think that the uh, test was very specific and certainly sensitive. They felt that the immunocap had a higher sensitivity, but a lower specificity than the intradermal skin testing. But still, you get that higher sensitivity. That's significant. And I think, especially if we have pediatric patients, it really does make a difference to not have to do, right? So I actually don't send a lot of immunocap, but because I do primarily pediatrics, we also don't have that many patients that are on venom immunotherapy. But when we do it, it's intradermal. So this was kind of music to my ears, to be honest with you, because it is a big deal. As a mom, I always say it's a big deal when we have to put children through a lot of these intradermal tests. And for venoms, we often do. Okay, well, good. Now this is, gets me off the hook. So I feel a lot better. And again, Stan, I really thank you so much for supporting our patients and so on. Well, Viv, you also have a really important issue relevant to children, and that is vaccination against flu. So Dr. why don't you tell us about your study? So I'm excited to talk about this one because in this day of vaccine hesitancy, any research or any papers that actually support the use of non-needle vaccines, I think is very refreshing. So this is actually an article published in Pediatrics in April of 2022. It was called The Safety of Live Attenuated Influenza Vaccine in Children with Asthma, which we've always thought that this was a contraindication, but this is a paper by Sokolo et al. that looked at this. And this was a prospective open-label clinical trial that compared the proportion of participants with asthma exacerbations post-immunization in children, this was five to 17 years of age. So the contraindication still exists in children below five, but this is in children five to 17 that received the live attenuated influenza vaccine quadrivalent versus the inactivated influenza vaccine quadrivalent. And it, here the study participants were enrolled over a two year period at three academic centers, which included Vanderbilt, Duke and Cincinnati Children's. And the children, again, five to 17, but they had a diagnosis of persistent asthma. In the 2018 to 2019 season, only children five to 11 years were enrolled. And then in the 2019 to 2020 children, children five to 17 were enrolled. And really the primary outcome, really, they were just looking at asthma exacerbations in these kids. There were 151 participants, 52 in the first time period, and then 99 from 2019 to 2020, which I thought was incredible considering this was right before the pandemic, so it's important timing. Within 42 days of post-vaccination, 12.7% of the participants overall had an asthma exacerbation. And in the live attenuate, it was 10.8% versus 14.7% in the inactivated vaccine. So really what they talked about was that the live attenuated really remains non-inferior to the inactivated. And I think, again, in this day and age of vaccine hesitancy, and I'll go to 
it was Dr. Samantha Knox is actually the one who reviewed it, who did remind us that the contraindication still remains for children under five with a history of asthma, but being able to offer a safe and effective alternative is essential. And having a non-needle option, I think is really important. What do you both think about this recent study? Oh man, I would love to have this for our kids. I actually don't have that available in my office, but I do feel lucky that Children's Health Atlanta does allow me to do it at point of care. So we could just talk to them. And then while they're still interested, we could just like vaccinate them right there. I mean, that conversion same day is helpful. So if the vaccine hesitancy is due to, oh, I promised them they wouldn't get a shot. I don't know how often you hear that. You know, Mm -hmm. I promised them they would get a shot. Like, okay, well, we can fix that with the live attenuated. I guess I have to convince the administration to get it, but at least I got some ammunition. Stan, how about you? Do you ever use the live? No, we just do the regular injection. In fact, we don't even have the high dose for people over 65. I think this is the pediatricians are the ones who usually use the intranasal. But I think this data really does support them being able to use that even in our asthmatics. And I think that hopefully we'll see some changes in practice patterns. Yeah, absolutely. Let's run it on with something I thought was a little interesting. I always like to challenge myself. So I did a journal club on this also when I reviewed an algae wash. This was published in Nature. And the title of the article is Obesity Alters Pathology and Treatment Response in Inflammatory Disease. And so we know about the relationship between obesity and atopy, we know that they have higher IgE levels, they're more likely to have a positive test. We know that obesity is a risk factor for asthma, whether it's that late onset phenotype or just nutrition influencing airway inflammation or lung function. And if you actually look at obese individuals, they do actually have immunologic changes. We know that obesity is pro-inflammatory. They've seen increased IL-6 and TNF-alpha and uh, there's been alterations in submucosal eosinophil content and so on. But I think they really wanted to look at AD for this. So they were looking at atopic dermatitis and they used a mouse model for this to really understand if you compare lean and obese mice, what is the effect on two models of atopic dermatitis? So they have like this vitamin D3 model where if you put that repetitively on a mouse, you can induce atopic dermatitis. And interestingly, they actually get worse AD if they have a high fat diet and develop obesity in this model. And they also did it with a second model, which was so for a tape stripping model using egg protein. But then they did something very interesting. They actually only did the high fat diet for nine weeks, and then they went to a normal diet. So they actually had high body mass index that went down, but they still had the exacerbation sort of suggesting that Any history of obesity just seemed to alter your immunologic reaction to AD. And they also found increased inflammation and asthmas too. So they did like a egg exposure to do sort of an asthma model. And so when you look at the immunology of these mice on the high fat diet, they actually have a mixed inflammatory profile where they both have TH2 and TH17 population. So it's sort of like the TH17 contribution from the obesity seems to be what's exacerbating the TH2 phenotype. And this has actually been demonstrated in obese patients. You can see increased TH17 and TH2 signatures, the higher body mass index increases, you get more of these IL-17 induced signature proteins and so on. And so if you do RNA-seq, which is just trying to understand the expression profiles of these mice, you actually see this TH17 population occur there. Now, this is the wild part. They actually gave sort of like a dupilumab equivalent. They gave this IL-4-13 treatment in these mice. It actually worsened their AD. So if you had obesity and a high-fat diet, And yet in this atopic dermatitis model, when you treated them with IL-4, IL-13 blockade, it worsened their AT. So why is that? Why would an anti-T2 therapy in this sort of obese mixed TH2, TH17 model inflammation worsen AD? And so one of the hypotheses they developed was 
You may be aware of these group of receptors called PPARs, perox peroxisome proliferator activated receptors. And we use this in diabetes. There's like these TDZ drugs that we use for reduce insulin resistance. And interestingly, these drugs reduce TH17 differentiation. So they wanted to understand the relationship of these PPARs. So they actually knocked it out in the mice. And interestingly, it reproduces that exacerbated AD phenotype. So like if you compare control mice to those who they knock out this PPAR gamma receptor, they actually have similar exacerbations in AD and this sort of non-TH2 signature. And I mentioned that worsening with that IL-413 blockade like dupilumab, in these PPAR knockouts, when you give them dupilumab in an AD model, it actually worsens them like the obesity. So if we think that that's related to that, and perhaps the contribution is this deficiency in this PPAR gamma, what they did was they gave rosaglitazone, which is a agonist for PPAR gamma. And what that did was it actually seemed to improve the AD in these obese mice, which I thought was really interesting. Now, again, this is a mouse model. I'm not sure if that is what's happening in real life, but sort of the hypothesis they're suggesting here is that if we think about ATP in obese patients, and they have this mix TH2 and TH17 signature, is it possible then that it may be a lack of response to traditional high T2 targeted drugs is because of this untreated TH17 inflammation present, and therefore we need to address that as well. And again, I'm not saying that we should start rosaglitazone on all those patients, but again, maybe further investigation of that could maybe understand differential responses to these drugs. So again, very exploratory study. Obviously, they kind of have to follow up, but we're just trying to nail down the mechanisms of what's the differences in A to P in these different populations. I wonder if at some point we'll be measuring PPARs in our patients that are non-responders to certain medications. You know, that's interesting that you said that because for the last few years, we've been looking at the different endotypes of asthma and obesity is one of the endotypes that they describe as very difficult to treat, but not necessarily always associated with allergy. In fact, rarely associated with allergy. And in terms of response to our normal biologics and typical treatment regimen with combos, they're much more difficult to treat. And you may be right. I think it's fascinating. And I don't understand all the physiologic mechanisms of these things, but I'm always fascinated in the fact that the more we learn about the biologic mechanisms and the pathophysiology of this, the more we realize that there's different opportunities to really target the treatment for these patients. So this is just probably another example of a potential targeted therapy. I recall a few papers coming out during my fellowship from Cincinnati where they were also looking at mixed TH2, TH17 populations in asthma as well, right? So again, I know this is an AD model, but at least we've seen these sort of co-expressors of TH2 and TH17 in some of the severe asthma patients. So I do think this is happening. I'm not sure what to do about it in terms of treatment or so on, but we do see people who are treatment resistant. They seem to follow the profile. We do the usual stuff, but they just don't respond as well. And I think there's something we're missing and this might be the key to get more patients under control. I'm really looking forward to more research in this direction. All right. Well, I think those are our three articles. If you really liked what you heard today, please rate our podcast on iTunes. It really helps us out. We do want your feedback, corrections, or suggestions for future episodes to email us that feedback. You go to allergytalk at acaai.org and we'll just send you a reply. We appreciate that. And remember, you can earn CME credit for listening to this podcast. For that information, the website is college.acaai.org slash publication slash allergy watch. Thank you so much for listening. I had a really great time. Viv, thank you again for joining us and hope everyone enjoy the rest of their day.
The ACAI is presenting this podcast for educational purposes only. It is not medical advice or intended to replace the judgment of a licensed physician. The college is not responsible for any claims related to the procedures, professionals, products, or methods discussed in the podcast, and it does not approve or endorse any products, professional services, or methods that may be referenced. Today's speakers have the following disclosures. Dr. Lee has nothing to disclose. Dr. Hernanda Trujillo has been a speaker for Takeda and CSL. He's been an advisory board for Takeda, Regeneron, and Santa Fe, and has been a consultant for Kaleo Farming, ends of it, National Peanut Board, and the Algae and Asthma Network. Dr. Feynman has been a speaker for Takeda and has done research with AI Immune, DBV, and BioChrist. 